praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above you, heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Amen 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 God we praise you God we praise you Praise God for all that He has done. Praise Him for He has overcome. The grave is beaten, love has won. Praise God our Savior Christ the Son. Amen 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 God we praise you God we praise you We're singing, Amen, 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 Amen. We praise you, we praise you, oh. Amen, 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 Amen. We praise you, we praise you, oh. Amen, Amen, Amen. Amen, amen, amen. We praise you. We praise you. Oh, amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. We praise you. We praise you. The Weekly Word is an online way for us at Gracious Savior Church to reach out to people who can't come to our in-person Sunday services at 9.30 a.m. But if you live in the Vale Valley, we would love to see you there. You can see our mission and ministries up on the screen right now. And if you have a question about any of these as they show up, go ahead and let us know. Reach out to us by clicking on one of our email links in the description of this video. Now it's time for a message from God's Word with Pastor Jason. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We are walking through our series, The Big Questions, which was based on questions and statements we got from our Christmas Eve service uh, last year. And this is the topic I was expecting to get the most questions from, and we absolutely did. One third of our responses were based on this issue. Why is there evil? Why is there suffering? It's a, it's a great question. It's the biggest question. It's probably the oldest question too. Even the Greek philosopher Epicurus from the third century BC, he asked this question. He wrote this. Either God wants to abolish evil and cannot, or he can but does not want to. If he wants to, but, but cannot, God is impotent. If God can and does not want to, he is wicked. But if God both can and want to abolish evil, then how comes evil in the world? As I said, over 30% of our responses were on this question, and here's some of what we got. As a just God, why is there so much injustice? When will you step in, God? Why did the fall have to happen? Why rape? Why murder? Why bad things happen to good people? 
Why are we so weak and mean? Why did you let the snake and evil into the garden? Why can't I have a baby? Knowing that people were going to destroy this beautiful earth and animals and each other, why did you bother? Where are you, God? Why do some people have to die so too soon? Why is there so much divide between the nations, so much divide between poor and rich? Why guns? Why did you make us in your image, but we're so imperfect? Why did my brother have to suffer my, under my stepdad's cruelty? 2024, and why so many bad things happened to me, one after another, bad things. Sandy Hook, Uvalde, Oklahoma City massacres. Why do children suffer? My daughter's health issues. Why did you create evil? Why do you allow bad things to happen to kids? Incredible cries from great loss and loneliness. Those are great questions. I cannot possibly answer all of them in, in 20 minutes. I'm going to give it my best shot. But, but here are some good resources for you. Uh, the book by C.S. Lewis called The Problem of Pain. It's a challenging book. It's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. I also recommend The Case for Faith by Lee Strobel. Uh, it's an easier read. It's a more uh, accessible read. Uh, and it does a great job as well. So to jump into this challenging issue, I want to ask you this. How many of you have either babysat or watched or parent uh, a toddler for more than one hour? All right. So if you watch a toddler for any length of time, you know that toddlers are great. Toddlers, they sit on your lap. They'll cuddle. They'll let you read a book to them. They'll point at the pictures and maybe you will point at a car and say car. And the toddler will go, ka, you know, it's awesome. Toddlers are amazing. They'll toddle on over and they'll give you a hug. They'll give you sloppy kisses on your face. They get all cute and messy when they're eating. Toddlers are the best. Toddlers are the worst. Toddlers will scream at you because you didn't give them the red cup. They will, you will take you five minutes to figure out why they're screaming. They will poop their diaper and not let you change it. They will throw a 10 minute temper tantrum about being put into their car seat only to be fine 10 seconds later. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually control your toddler? No more temper tantrums in the grocery store. No more fights while potty training. No more screaming because it's time to leave the park because you turned off Bluey or because it's just time for bed. Wouldn't it be great if your toddler was all good and never bad? Wouldn't it be great if your toddler was all hugs and no tantrums, all kisses and never biting, all sweet and never sour and stinky? But would it? Would it be great? Is it really love if it's not voluntarily given? Is it really obedience if it's coerced? Would that hug, would that cuddle, would that sloppy kiss on your face, would it mean anything if the child had no other choice? Imagine a world where no one does anything wrong. A world with no evil, no accidents, no murder, no theft, no backstabbing, no betrayal, no choice or option to do any of those, th those things. Just some divine electric shock collar. Anytime something rude or selfish was even going to come out of your mouth, right? You'd say, you'd be talking with your wife and say, you know, if you really cared about me, then you would. <laughs> Nothing, dear. I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. It's a world where free will does not exist. And a world where free will does not exist is a world where love does not exist. The possibility of doing wrong is what it makes it possible for love. That's the definition of love. It's a gift given. 
That's how love is. It's, it's not coerced. If it's coerced, it's not love. If it's forced, it's not love. If there's no other option, it's not love. That free will, which is responsible for the worst in this world, is what makes it possible for love and the best in this world. It's a great movie called Bruce Almighty. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It is PG-13, so be, be aware of that. But it's a very well done movie. And they, they talk about this question of free will and love. In the movie, Bruce is given all the powers of God and he can do anything he wants except make his girlfriend, whom he has treated poorly, love him. And there's one scene in the movie where Bruce is reaching out to her and he's going, love me. And she won't because love must be freely given. It can't be coerced or forced. The potential of love in this world is what makes this world amazing. And at times, that free will, that same free will, makes this world horrible too. So if you were God, which would you choose? Love or robots? Just programmed to do exactly what you wanted them to do at all times. God shows love. Epicurus, at the beginning of this sermon, makes an, an unconscious or unsaid assumption, and that is this, that nothing good comes from pain and suffering. But we know that isn't true. Growth requires pain. No pain, no gain. C.S. Lewis wrote this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Pain creates growth. It can create growth, I should say that. Pain can create repentance. It can create dependence on God. There's some good things that happen in our suffering. The Apostle Paul, he wrote this in Romans 5. He said, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I want to introduce you to someone who's very special to me and our congregation. Her name is Karen. And Karen... Um, was diagnosed a few years ago with Parkinson's. And it was challenging, to say the least. Parkinson's is a, it's a hard disease. It's something that no one wants. And so I had the, the honor uh, to interview Karen about her experience with Parkinson's and, and how that's affected her relationship with God. And I'd like to show that interview you to you right now. So my first question for you is, um, what did you think, first think, when you knew you had Parkinson's? It's kind of strange because I went to a chiropractor to be adjusted. Mm -hmm. And one time when I went there, he said, you know, you have Parkinson. And so I wasn't at a neurology. It was just my chiropractor who told me. And so it was like, hmm, I wasn't sure. And my home doctor wanted me to go to a neurologist and I wasn't sure I wanted to go. And then finally, I did go um, to the one in Glenwood. Mm -hmm. And I was made it really clear that I didn't want him to diagnose me, say, telling me how much time I had or what the downside was. I wanted to leave room for God to work. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> and he was a Christian man, and so he totally got it. Okay, cool. Okay. Were, were you afraid at all? Yes, I was afraid. Yeah. It was. It was scary, and you know, when I first had the chiropractor tell me that, I went and cried on the way home. Yeah. Because I wasn't sure what it meant, and it wasn't what I had planned for, and right. um, I had other plans of what I wanted to do, but huh. but luckily the fear didn't last super long. That's good. I had to have faith in God that He was in control. Yeah. What have you learned about God these past few years here? 
He has been so good to me. He, wow. There are so many gifts he gives his children. Yeah. And um, just like when I went to the rehab center, mm -hmm. there was no room, no beds available. And right. so I would have had to have gone to Grand Junction. Yeah. And two days later, they had a bed before me. So when right. I left the hospital, I could go right to right. Eagle and my family could come visit me every day. Right. That was right after a broken hip? Yeah, a broken hip. I fell yeah. and broke my hip. Yeah. And they did surgery the Sunday after Thanksgiving. That's right. What have you learned about yourself these past couple of years? I like myself better that God's worked with me. Uh -huh. And... There, there are so many gifts I've had from having Parkinson, of just knowing that God's there and angels who's watched over me and mm -hmm. things that have been available to me and people in the church who have been so kind to me that I wouldn't have had all those things. Yeah. Um, and I do a big schedule of working out so every day about I'm doing something. Nice. And I wouldn't have done that had I not had Parkinson. I would. Uh -huh. Of, and I was lonely before I got it. Mm -hmm. And I don't like living alone necessarily. But God brought so many people into my life that I have so many people who care about me. And uh -huh. it just it touches my heart every time when somebody offers to do something that of kindness. It's uh -huh. just, it just melts my heart. Yeah, yeah. You, you told me before that, that God's growing you. So what, what are some ways you see God growing you through through Parkinson's? By going to the rehab center from after my surgery, I had people who'd come in and say, you have so many people who visit you. And mm -hmm. and where do you, what church do you go to? And uh -huh. um, when I first got there, I was very unhappy for a day sure. and cried. I wanted to go home instead. Uh -huh. Um, but I had so many, and then after that, it was like, here are all these people who care, are caring for me. And mm -hmm. I got to know the people and the doctors and the nurses. And it it just it made it so I had a second family when I was there. Wow. And it wasn't sad then. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, and even today on Valentine's Day, one of the nurses texted me this morning that I'd met with. And I was there where she'd walk the halls with me with my walker. Uh -huh. And so for her to go and text me and still have a relationship with someone who was at the rehab center is amazing to me. It's amazing. It must have made a pretty big impact on her. Yeah, her everybody was so kind, and yeah. I was so blessed because when you're in a place like that, you see lots of things that are not very fun for people to have. Right. And right. so to go and be able to touch, touch people's hearts and... Yeah. Have people be kind right. and work hard to get out of there. Yeah, yeah, that's a beautiful perspective because um, you've been self-sufficient for a very long time. I have, and uh, pretty successful as well. Uh, and uh, and now you're in a position of of receiving from a lot of folks. You, you were a, a giver for so many years and helping so many people out, and raising your kids and. And serving on boards and everything like that, and now uh, you're receiving from others, right? Uh, and God's God's using that in your life too, right? Right. I mean, there's so many gifts. I, I look at. I'm I'm just celebrated my 70th birthday. Happy we, birthday! And we went to Hawaii to celebrate. Uh -huh. And so God planned that that when I was in Hawaii, I had nothing was broken. Everything was working. I was able to walk around. I didn't need a walker. I didn't need a cane. And I saw people there who did have those things. And so the timing of when I fell and got hurt didn't interfere with the trip to Hawaii that God Good. planned for me. Good. So, right. you know, mm -hmm. there, there are lots of things that I got to do in my life. And so I tried to look at all the, all the fun things I had, riding horses and going on trail rides and uh -huh. bicycle trips or... There were so many things that I did that I was able to do. And so right now, if I can't do those things, God has in mind for me to do other things. Mm -hmm. um, and just sitting in church and the Holy Spirit can come to me when we're singing songs and I start crying. And <coughs> I'm so blessed that, that I can feel his presence, that he's there right. watching over me. Yeah. Yeah. I am, I'm sure if you had your choice, 
you would you would choose not to have Parkinson's. It's, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing, but I'm so blessed. I, I mean, I have I have so many people who care about me and love me and who, you know, my weight trainer found me when or came over the day that I broke my hip uh -huh. and was there with me and we went to the hospital and I have so many people who care about me and, you know, uh -huh. There's someone in the church, Laura, who t drives me to my doctor appointments in Glenwood, you know, and so I, uh, there's so many things I wouldn't have been so outgoing or in need of people to be closer to had yeah. I not had it. Wow. So does anyone want to have Parkinson? No, but it, it's not such a bad, it's, it's, there's a whole lot of good things. Yeah. You know, yeah. just to even have a doctor who is a Christian man. Mm -hmm. Um, and I go to see him only twice a year. Wow. And the last visit I had was in October, and he told me I was better then than I was six Good. months before that. Good. So it's it's amazing to be blessed. You just have to look for the blessings, and yeah. the more you see them, the more you listen to what God wants you to do. And God's serving you and, and blessing you through this real hard hard thing that you're going through as well. Yeah. I mean, I think I always laugh when you said you could hear me coming down the hall with the church, that I'd shuffle my feet. And I think I walk better now than I did back then, mm -hmm. that I don't shuffle my feet because I've worked on it. And uh, there, there's a whole lot of things I can do to make it better. That's great. Karen, thanks so much for sharing with us. Uh, you're an inspiration to me uh, and seeing how... God's growing you through all this and uh, I just want to thank you so much for serving me and uh, teaching me about what God does uh, through hard stuff. Thank you. You're welcome and I'm so glad I'm a part of our church family that I'm so blessed and I love everybody and I appreciate everybody who prayed for me and I know that all made a difference. And I remember you saying to me, you didn't want to be known as a church as Karen goes Parkinson's uh, but, but Karen, who, who loves people and loves to come to church. And uh, not, not for anyone to feel sorry for you. Oh, yeah, I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. Yeah. I have so many blessings. I'm... Growth requires suffering. And when we allow God to, to speak to us, he grows us. Not, not really in our good times, but especially in our hard times. So, Karen, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thirdly, God is present in our suffering. See, none of this matters. None of this discussion matters if we believe that God does not love us. Or worse, God does love us, but is just incapable of doing anything about our suffering. But we do not worship a God who watches us from a distance. We do not love a God who's just doing his best. We worship a God who entered into his own world. Tim Keller, he said this. When a Russian cosmonaut returned from space and reported that he had not found God, C.S. Lewis responded that this was like Hamlet going into the attic of his castle looking for Shakespeare. If there is a God, he would not be another object in the universe that could be put in a lab and analyzed with empirical methods. He would relate to us the way a playwright relates to the characters in his own play. We, the characters, might be able to know quite a lot about the playwright, but only to the degree the author chooses to put information about himself into the play. The miracle of the incarnation is this, that, that Jesus wrote himself into his own play, his own creation. And in doing so, he experienced the worst of this world. He was homeless. He was abandoned by his friends. He was betrayed by one of them. He was unjustly arrested. He was uh, suffered, beaten, tortured, and murdered. And he went through all of it so that you would know the love of God. He endured the cross so that you might know God's forgiveness. He endured the suffering so that you know that God knows what you're going through and walks with you through it. And that you might have hope because of his resurrection and his life for you. The worst thing that ever happened in this world happened to Jesus on the cross. 
Because in essence, he's the, truly the only good person, the only perfect person who walked this world. And the ultimate evil, the sin of the world, was placed on him on the cross. He endured the worst so that you might know his best for you. His love for you. This is a, a poor attempt at answering the, the most difficult of questions uh, suffering is hard. I, I don't want to minimize it. But God cares for you. He does. And so I want to encourage you to switch our question around. Instead of asking why, why does this bad thing happen? Why did that horrible thing happen? Why am I going through this? To ask instead, where? God, where are you? Where are you in my suffering? Where are you in my Parkinson's? Where are you in this horrible loss that I've experienced? Where are you, God? And God is where he always is. He's crucified and he's risen for you. And you can have hope. Even in dark and hopeless times. You can have hope because of God's victory over death and the grave and sin for you. And we rest in that hope and we pray, come Lord Jesus. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, may it guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus our Lord for life everlasting. Amen.